Let's get going. So hello, everyone, and, and thanks for joining us after this little technical glitch. Welcome to this presentation, which is part of an ongoing Goose webinar series uh, exploring issues and, and uh, projects associated with global sustained ocean observing. I'm Albert Fisher, the director of the Global Ocean Observing System Pro Program Office, which is headquartered at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO here in Paris. So for the next hour, we'll start with about 30 minutes of presentation from Nick Bax, who is from CSIRO and co-chair of the Goose Biology and Ecosystems Panel, followed by Frank Miller Carger from the University of South Florida and co-chair of the Marine Biodiversity Observing Network, MBON. And finally, Eduardo Klein from the Universidad Simón Bolívar and co-chair of the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, OBIS, steering group. After the presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session by chat. I'll moderate and select and ask the questions verbally. The chat window is open during the presentation. It's open right now. Uh, if you'd like to start asking clarifying questions or introduce yourself, introduce yourself like many people have done. We are recording a session, and a link to the recording will be posted on the Goose web page. So, Nick, let me hand it over to you to start. OK, good. Thank you, Albert. Is that coming through clearly? It is. Um, right. Thank you, everyone, for um, attending this webinar. It's the first one I've done, so um, I hope we won't get too many technical glitches. Um, I was. Originally, going to talk, oh, I'm going to talk about the uh, Global Ocean Observing System. I first have a um, just a couple of overall slides about the Goose um, network itself before I move into the main topic of what I'm talking about, which is the recent work being done by the Biology and Ecosystems Panel. So I'm going to go through the first slides quite quickly, as I expect some of you know about these. Um, so the first first slide here shows the uh, Global Ocean Observing System, um, the goal of this system, which is a permanent global system for observations, um, has three major areas, climate, real-time services, and ocean health, and, um, and divided up into really three different panels, physics, biogeochemistry, and biology. The physics panel especially has been going on for a long time, quite successfully. Biogeochemistry panel um, has been making major inroads in the last five years. And the biology panel really is just, just starting up. We've been going for about two years now. Um, the Goose kind of works around a framework for ocean observing, nicknamed the FOO. And uh, the idea is it, it developing essential ocean variables, which helps kind of coordinate what we need to measure and how we need to measure it. The overall framework um, allows the input, what are the requirements, what do we need to measure, and, um, and then that goes into how the process of how these variables are going to be measured. A lot of work is done on how to use different platforms, how to coordinate those different platforms, and then finally the output. So how is that data going to be used? How is it going to be made useful to address societal issues? Um, there's a steering committee with oversight of scientific oversight for the three different panels. Also, um, a lot of observation coordination through JCOM, the Goose Region Alliances, and then also project development through things like Atlantos, the Deep Ocean Observing Strategy, and TPOS, the Tropical Pacific Ocean Observing System. And I did just want to emphasize um, there are 15 Goose Region Alliances, one of which is in Australia, the IMOS system. And this provides a kind of a global network of, um, of regional alliances in which we can use to help um, develop and use these essential ocean variables throughout the world. I think an important point about the Global Ocean Observing System is that it does sit under IOC UNESCO, and as such has a clear UN role in supporting various negotiations, especially in capacity building and technology transfer. I think something as we're going forward, we, we will be understanding how we link the need to measure um, ocean variables with the mandate to support capacity building and technology transfer around the world. And I think those two elements together provide quite a powerful mechanism moving forward to uh, improve global observing through, through that capacity building. So in the uh, biology and ecosystem panel, we uh, adapted the process slightly of the um, FOO. 
this first program, first slide shows in the center there, I think what might be quite a standard model to some of you, the driver pressure state impact response model, something which is used quite regularly throughout government. And um, in this case, we adapted it so that we use that general process to identify the EO, the essential ocean variables. First of all, looking at um, what were the drivers and pressures, we reviewed 24 international conventions to understand what were the major areas which needed to be um, reported on by countries reporting to these international conventions. Secondly, we wanted to understand feasibility. What is, um, what is out there? What can be done? And in this case, we had a survey of 104 different observing programs around the world to understand what was being measured where and for how long. So in a way, what was feasible, what was already being measured. And then the next stage was going through to prioritize those, those uh, variables. So looking at uh, um, doing literature reviews, working out for the various um, EOVs which seem to be coming through that system, which ones are actually linked to drivers and pressures. And that required a review of many papers over the last 20 years. And then finally, the stage we're at now, which is having developed these EOVs, essential ocean variables, are now developing far more detailed specification sheets, which identify the variables, the sub-variables, derived products, methods, networks will be used, and data and information, how to kind of make these, uh, make these EOVs work. Um, this is just one example of the kind of information being, uh, being produced from this, from this work. So this is a summary of biological ocean observations since, since when and what. And um, I'm really showing it just to illustrate the point that all these data are now publicly available through OBIS and we hope to keep these data updated as time goes on so that as new networks come online, we can start to keep a, a kind of a global idea of what's being measured and what is the potential. So this is kind of the plot of um, the essential of ocean, ocean variables we have at the moment based on impact and feasibility. And um, I think some of the interesting things here is on the left-hand axis, you can see relative impact and having very high impact being reported a lot of association with pressures and, and national needs are things like mangrove cover and coral cover, which actually have quite a low feasibility um, suggesting at the moment or indicating at the moment there are very few international networks which are measuring these variables in a consistent manner. Meanwhile, on the bottom right, we have things like phytoplankton as abundance, zooplankton abundance, which have um, a very relatively high feasibility. This is kind of things which are measured quite a lot, but they're not quite so um, prevalent in the need in international um, conventions. So we have two different roles here. One is to improve the feasibility of, um, of high impact areas such as mangroves and corals then also to uh, translate things which we do really well, phytoplankton, zooplankton, translate them so they are being of use to international and national reporting. And we can then go back and look at these different variables and see how they, how they address societal pressures. So we can check all the time and see um, how each of these variables which are being identified can, uh, can support the international reporting through things like uh, the Sustainable Development Goals or Aichi targets, many of the other international conventions. So um, these are the essential ocean variables from, from all the different panels. And um, on the bottom right, there's a, a kind of a concept which the uh, goose uses, which is um, dividing the variables up into up into three different areas really. Ones which are concept and idea, we, we think it's a good idea to develop that as a variable. And then pilot ones, implementation, where we're actually ready to think this is a variable which we need to use, we are testing it in various areas. And finally mature, so one which is uh, ready to be used and reported on globally. And you can see that under physics and bi biogeochemistry, a lot of their variables are already in that mature phase. But under biology and ecosystems, with the exception of zooplankton, biomass and diversity and live coral, we're probably really very much in the concept idea. Although we've been measuring some of these areas for quite a long time, they're still not at the point where we have a globally consistent system. They're still not at the point where we're reporting them globally. 
So quite a bit of work is still need to be done in the biology and ecosystem space. And the following steps we're coming up with now are um, validation. Um, having come up with these essential ocean variables, we need to check them, discuss them with the scientific community, develop them further, develop them further with policymakers, and also start moving them into various established areas such as GCOS, where they have essential climate variables. A lot of this does require peer review because it does require people around the world to realize that this might you might be a suitable framework in which we can move essential ocean variables through or ocean observing through for the biology and ecosystem place. Um, there's also a large effort of integration. How can we use existing physics networks, for example, to start collecting biological information such as uh, zooplankton or phytoplankton? And we've had uh, started off with some workshops there to understand what those cross-platform technologies would look like. And then lastly, um, in many of the areas, we do need to get together and work out a standardized methods and data collection. And uh, I think I will conclude. So um, I think the Global Ocean Observing System has successfully coordinated development of physical and bi biogeochemical essential ocean variables. And uh, in the biology and ecosystem place, we identified a collaborative dynamic scientific process which allows us to identify biological variables, um, currently four species and four habitat ones. As it's a dynamic process, we can add more as those become available. Um, and we're at a process where these need to be communicated and discussed to get general agreement, um, that it provides a reasonable way forward, both in the science and policy environment. So thank you all for listening to this talk. And uh, we recognize now that we're at the process. In some ways, it becomes more difficult we now need that detailed work on each GOV to standardize methods, reporting and data access, extend existing networks and achieve cross-platform efficiencies. And lastly, I think going back to the point I made right at the beginning, developing a truly global network in this space, I think is going to require a lot of capacity building and technology transfers because a lot of the biology and ecosystem variables will be quite local. They need to be measured in each individual country. They're not something which is so much part of an integrated global model. And as such, EOVs provide a focus for sustained capacity building because we do have these existing networks which will allow us to maintain capacity over the long term. And the IOC, through its role, IOC UNESCO, is in a unique position really to provide that capacity building and technology transfer linked to this focus of essential ocean variables. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, I'm just going to actually test again if we can hear Eduardo. Eduardo, could you try speaking before I hand it over to Frank? OK. Still not having luck. OK, thanks very much, Nick. Actually, let me ask you a question while we're going in. And please feel free to ask questions uh, in the chat. I just want to ask you to be a little more um, specific about the uh, the idea of feasibility and impact, and particularly how to transform things that we measure quite feasibly into something that has a higher impact. What kind of work is necessary to do that? There's a lot of work going on now to look at international reporting. So the CBD, for example, has the Aichi targets, and uh, there's a group that the, although those targets have been set and we have indicators, there's still quite a bit of work of how those indicators will be measured and, and communicated. So at the level of the scientific process, there's still quite a lot to be work there to be, needs to be done. It's even, I think, more significant in the area of sustainable development goals. Um, at the moment, they're quite, um, the indicators being used for those are, are quite poorly defined. Um, and I think what our role is, is really just to identify which EOVs are, or which indicators are scientifically valid to be putting forward into that process and then start promoting them into that process so people recognize that they're ready to go. OK, thanks a lot, Mick. So what we'll do is actually move on with uh, Frank and come come back to uh, a general, more, more general discussion with all the speakers. I do want to check one more time. Eduardo, I see that your microphone is on. Can you just test? Yes, uh, hello, how are you? How, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, that's good. So we'll come back to you after we hear from Frank. Frank, please go ahead. Excellent, thank you. 
Thanks, Oliver. So I think that you're seeing, uh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, I, I really want to build on Nick's presentation because Goose is a, a network of real observing systems in which different countries and different entities are putting real effort. And uh, it has been focused a lot on the physics uh, in the past. It is developing the capability to add biogeochemical observations. And the one thing that we're really missing are some of the most important measurements about life in the ocean. And that's what we're trying to organize with this uh, MBON concept, the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. The idea here is to add observations to, uh, of life from microbes to whales. So the, the way that we define biodiversity is that it's really simply the number of species, but also the abundance of the biomass, productivity, and the interactions between organisms and the environment, but also the variability of the ecosystem in terms of how a habitat is changing. These things sound really basic. They, they sound like they're common sense, but they're extremely difficult to make. And so uh, these measurements are what's missing right now in the way that we understand, or we need to make these measurements to understand the ocean better. So to do that, the, the Group on Earth Observations, Biodiversity Observation Network, or GEOBON, has come up with this concept and trying to organize the community or to try to see if there's a path to make this type, these types of observations from an operational point of view. So making genetic composition observations, species and populations, species, species traits, these are what we're calling essential biodiversity variables. And so these, these things will feed into uh, the type of societally relevant uh, needs that that the CBD or other groups like IPBES would require. So organizing these essential biodiversity variables is taking a lot of effort, quite academic at the moment. We're trying to highlight the relevance of measuring life uh, both on land and, and in the ocean, also in the atmosphere. So this, these essential variables in the ocean fit, uh, from my point of view, what we're calling the EBVs, or the essential biodiversity variables, are a subset of the essential ocean variables that Nick talked about. So the different uh, goose panels, uh, the physics, biogeochemistry, and biological or bioeco panel, are trying to come up with a definition of what is an essential ocean variable. So what, what, do, what are the essential or the minimum set of variables that we need to measure to understand uh, these, the ocean. And from a biological point of view, there's these EBVs that are a subset of that very large uh, set of essential ocean variables. And so we have the GOOSE efforts organized under the IOC, the Group on, on Earth Observations, or GEOBON, where we sit as MBON, trying to coordinate with GOOSE. And then there are all the national and academic programs that are also making measurements. And ideally, we would like to see how we organize all of this and uh, share information. So here's an example, and this is what concerns me. This is a, Eduardo is going to talk about all this in the next uh, presentation. On the left-hand side, you see a global picture of the uh, 47 million records that OBIS has, and they, it goes back over 100 years. And on the right-hand side, if we, if we explore the OBIS database, we see the issues that we have in terms of gaps, and that's what we're trying to address with Goose, M1, and OBIS. Uh, for example, these are surface or near-surface measurements in the world's ocean, in, let's say in the upper uh, 20 meters, and as you get close to the coast, it's really uh, uh, going all the way to the bentos, but just in the, uh, in the uh, near shore. What you see is that there's a lot of the ocean that is still gappy. And if you look at the upper right-hand corner, there's a time series of the observations that we have both in coastal areas, that's the red line, and in the pelagic area. And you see how the, the number of observations in, in August decreases sharply after about 2010. So we're, we're trying to monitor life in the ocean and come up with indicators of how 
biodiversity may be changing or the productivity of the ocean or the biomass in the ocean. And if, if we don't have a system that is populated on a routine basis in, in a sustained manner and it's uh, at present current, then it's very hard to react if we have information that's 10 years old. So one of the efforts is also to encourage the sharing of information in databases that are open and useful to these processes like the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals or the Convention on Biological Diversity or IPBES. And right now we don't have that. So it's very important to, to try to organize ourselves to, to get there. So why measure biodiversity? I, I think that for many people this, this may not be obvious, but for some it is not. And biodiversity in, is really a unique characteristic of this planet. It, it, the diversity of life really helps ecosystem function and the resilience of, of the ecosystems. It is very uh, much part of the biogeochemical cycles. And then we depend on it for food, materials, chemicals, and things like recreation. So observing life in the sea is very multidisciplinary. I, we don't recommend making biological measurements outside of or without making physical measurements like temperature or salinity, very basic things. And also, we have to understand life in the context of biogeochemical cycles. So this will require advancing technology, applications, and human capacity so that we can make these biological measurements and interpret the measurements in terms of physics and biogeochemistry. So we want a network that organizes databases and data sets and that we can filter in terms of taxa or by space or over time and to produce things like global maps or regional maps or even our local maps to track abundance and trends in these properties. And that's what MBON is trying to organize. What we're advocating then is to try to come up with a key time series of measurements. So not just one presence or, or absence observation uh, in, in one place, but to continue these observations in a sustained manner, both from satellites and also from in situ observations, and combining them in what may be some traditional metrics of biodiversity, like microscopy or flow through or just counts of organisms, but also with new methods like bioptics, HPLC, and uh, genetics, and combining those into what we're calling seascapes or ecological marine units that. Uh, are being developed under the geobond. For example, here on the left hand, you have uh, uh, efforts that are being tested like environmental DNA, where you take a sample of water and try to understand what has gone through or what, 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 what kind of organisms were in this parcel of water at any one time. And there's technology being developed to do this automatically. On the right hand side, you have the EMUs or ecological marine units and satellite seascapes uh, that are combined basically as a classification scheme uh, that comes up with uh, different biogeographic areas. And you try to put that in what the center representation here is in a, some type of uh, mapping tool or, or application. Here's an example of that. We're, we're doing something like this for Florida. We're doing something like that also in different parts around the US. Ideally, we're migrating to a global system where you take survey data, for example, fish data, uh, over time, and you can compute uh, biodiversity in the seas kind of on the fly by tracing a polygon and overlay that over environmental data, in this case, like sea surface temperature data from satellites. An example of that is, uh, for example, taking the uh, fisheries data uh, from FAO. You can do a classification of the fisheries catch on an annual basis in a time series with sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, and primer productivity in the, what we call the large marine ecosystems, or LMEs. And you can see that some, if you use these types of classifications, you can see that some LMEs are more similar than others. And we're trying to test these concepts to see if they're mega regions or how they change over time. And you can see also how the fishery is diversified over time in any one of these LMEs, and if that's related to any particular regulation or environmental variable. All of this that we're trying to do is, is intended to have some societal uh, relevance in, in addressing needs from the conventional biological diversity or any one of these uh, uh, conventions that we see here. One that we're trying to target very actively right now 
is the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and in particular Goal 14, which is uh, uh, basically life in the ocean. And Sustainable Development Goal 14 has 10 targets, and there are indicators for these targets that at the moment are very, uh, very poorly defined in terms of how you can actually track them. So we're trying to develop products that will uh, aid in that process. So the idea here is to have a call. The MBON is really all of us. It, it is a network. It's not really an observing system. We're trying to build on the GOOSE uh, concept and actually use infrastructure like buoys, uh, floats, cruises that the GOOSE has organized or national systems and engage the community of practice that measures life in the ocean. So through MBON, we can share protocols, information, and document best practices uh, to address the global needs that we all have or the local needs of any one country. So the goal is to go from the picture that we have above, that we have right now in terms of our uh, global databases of biodiversity, to something that is active and, and very productive in terms of how we measure life in the ocean. And for that, we want to uh, continue to make linkages with many of you that are online, uh, for example, in Marine Geo or Tenenbaum Observatory, from the Smithsonian, the UNEP, uh, WCMC, the Ameri AmeriGeos uh, Network for, uh, from, from the Group on Earth Observations, and EU, EU Bond, the Coral uh, Network, and so on. So there's a, a number of regional or thematic networks that we would like to uh, help connect with each other to see if we can come up with the uh, network that we're trying to describe here. So, uh, we seek your participation. We have working groups in, that are connected to the GeoBond in terms of uh, uh, things like uh, capacity building and something that we call bond in a box, or developing bonds in different countries or for different themes. And if you want to uh, link in with this effort, please contact any one of us here. I'm one of the co-chairs with Isabel Sousa Pinto and Mark Costello in the MBON. Thank you. Thanks very much, Frank. And uh, before I move on to Eduardo, let me just ask you a question. You showed a drop-off in the number of observations in the past few years. Is that actually a true drop-off in observations or a lag in reporting? I think it's a lag in reporting. Uh, there's probably uh, a number of issues here that we're uh, concerned with. One is that it takes time for people to clean up the data and validate it and quality control it. So, uh, But this lag is about 10 years now that we see that there's been a drop-off. Uh, I know that OBIS is working very hard uh, in trying to revamp itself and reinvent its software so that it can encourage people to provide the observations into all this. I know there's also some discussion about how you have a, 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 an embargo in, in the way that some people don't want to offer the data up to systems like Orbis if there's no protection for their, their intellectual property. So this is something that we have to deal with. So the combination of that with uh, people not really knowing how to put data into all this with the um, uh, just plain data quality control, I think combined leads to that drop off. But if we, if we pretend that we're going to monitor biodiversity in the world's oceans with a system like OBIS or GBIF and we see this type of a, a drop off, it's hard to understand how life is changing if uh, we don't have an, uh, uh, a, a current database. Okay, thanks, Frank. Um, why don't we move on to Eduardo, and then we'll come back with questions for all three of you. And uh, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box along the way. So let's um, move to Eduardo. Yes, I am here. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Hello? Yeah, it's a little bit quieter than everyone else, but we can. Yeah, hello now. Much better. It's better. Eduardo, we can just we'll adjust our volumes on our end. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Eduardo, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank 
you very much. Um, I will talk now about uh, OBIS, which is the Ocean Biogeographic Information System. And uh, this is an, uh, a project from the IOC uh, UNESCO IODE program. And um, uh, a little bit of history about the uh, OBIS. OBIS was designed as a repository uh, for the data collected during the project Census of Marine Life uh, during 2000 decade. Um, uh, Census of Marine Life had uh, 16 different projects all around the world, and uh, they provide a platform uh, to uh, store and integrate and disseminate all the, all the information collected from those projects. Once the census project ends in 2010, uh, the project OBIS was adopted by the UNESCO IOC project. Uh, and then in 2011, the Secretariat uh, of OBIS uh, was moved from Groteg University to Ostend, Bel Belgium, which is uh, uh, right now retiring right now. So um, uh, probably you have seen, uh, you hear about OBIS a little bit, but uh, as, a, as a global database. But OBIS is more than a, a global database, it's a network. It's a network of centers of regional nodes um, that uh, provide uh, data to the central database and also provide some uh, quality control and uh, interactions with the uh, data providers and uh, provide some solutions to the local and regional partners uh, using uh, data from OBIS. Right now we have more than uh, 28 different nodes all around the world and you can see that uh, uh, those nodes uh, collect data from these uh, uh, small red dots that are the institutions that are providing data. Right now, we have more than uh, 600 institutions and from uh, providing data from more than 2,000 different uh, data sets. Uh, sorry, something happened here? Got that. Let me just... Um to come back oh um well why well, well, okay now we're we're back here sorry uh, sorry about that yeah i don't have the control of the presentation so if you want to pass the slide the slide for me right now Okay, now, um, OBIS, uh, so OBIS is uh, composed by three main components. So we have the, um, the nodes, as I mentioned, that provide the, the uh, data from the data centers or projects. Uh, they do the quality control of the data, uh, they assemble the data set and standardize and then provide data to the IOBIS, um, which is the uh, section you have on the right side. And IOBIS is the central database. So IOBIS provide the data analytics, we provide some scientific anal analysis tools like our package I will talk about later, and some visualization and data extraction features. And then uh, we come back to our data providers that actually are the ones that are collecting data. The data providers could be a program, could be a, an institution, could be a, a single a single scientific project that collects information and they put through the information through the OBIS node and then the OBIS node uh, do the quality control and then send it to the central OBIS. Next, please. please. Uh, so you see now the same uh, map that, that Frank show you uh, previously. Uh, here you have the 47 million records that we have right now. And you can see uh, that uh, most of the records are located in the coastal areas in the Northern Hemisphere. And we have uh, important gaps in, in the data in the middle of the oceans where um, nobody or very few people has already sampled uh, biodiversity information. Next, please. And if you analyze this um, in terms of, of all what we have, so you can see here that we have um, almost 48 million records from uh, 2,000 data sets. And uh, we have uh, uh, almost 110,000 different marine species stored in the, in the, in the database. Also, we can uh, filter by the, uh, the number of wrecked species or invasive species that, that we have. So you can use it as an indicator for uh, your uh, uh, development uh, initiatives. So you can have, uh, you can see in the bottom the, the figures that show how many records we have in time, and you can see also the dot that uh, Frank was mentioning in the, in the previous presentation. Next, please. And if you analyze the, uh, the, the all the data sets in, in, in the global context, 
you can see that uh, uh, most of the break core are not only in the uh, shallow areas, but uh, the areas nearby the continent, which is logic because it's easier and cheaper to, to, to sample uh, in those localities. But uh, you can see that, for example, uh, we have uh, big holes in the middle of the oceans, in the middle of the water column. So if you uh, analyze the, the situation in terms of water volume, uh, we now know that uh, almost 99% of the ocean volume is under sampled. So uh, we can use all this to identify the gaps we have in the, in, in the data and direct uh, for the uh, initiative of research. Next, please. So OBIS, OBIS work OBIS is, is based on standards, um, and we are very um, uh, proud of that, and we are, we are trying to keep uh, the, the highest standard possible. So we have a standard for the data, and we are using the Darwin core, uh, which, is a, which is an international standard for um, incorporating the stride in the biodiversity records. And we are also using um, ecological metadata, metadata language, which is a metadata specification designed, designed uh, for the ecology uh, discipline. And uh, this metadata is, is, um, is, mod is modular, so we can uh, use whatever we want. Uh, we, we it's, compat it's compatible with uh, other uh, standards. And um, they have a, a very uh, detailed structure, so it's very flexible. So uh, all the data in Orbis uh, comply with uh, Darwin Core standard and with the metadata standard from the EMR. Next, please. And um, we are doing to the data uh, some 30 different uh, quality control uh, procedures that comes from, uh, uh, from the taxonomy, checking using uh, uh, World Register of Marine Species, uh, checking if the date and the death are in correct format, the, the point is in land or it's in shore, it's a marine species or it's a terrestrial species, et cetera, et cetera. So every node uh, is responsible to do the quality control of the data as they are provided to the central lobbies. Next, please. So now, um, uh, before before Ovis was uh, containing only uh, occurrence uh, biodiversity records, and now we are working with a new uh, schema uh, that we call environmental data and extended measurement or FAD that allow us to incorporate along with the biodiversity data register uh, environmental registers, registers as Frank mentioned. So for example, you can have uh, in the left an example of a cruise and you have a stations and then the station you have a, a, a one bin uh, graph, and then you can have the occurrence of the species that you can sample with benthic uh, um, sampling. And you can uh, accommodate along with this occurrence, for example, the grain size, the, uh, the nutrient, and, and whatever variable you can, you can uh, measure along with a biodiversity register. So this is, a, this is a very flexible way to incorporate both uh, uh, type of uh, information information inside all this. So we are using the IPT, which is the um, Integrated Publishing Toolkit, to incorporate the data into OBIS, which is a, a platform that uh, allows the matching between the your tables and, and our Darwin Core standard. Next, please. Uh, so we have three ways to access in OBIS. So we have the portal, which is the iobis.org, and we have uh, some uh, uh, Open Global consor uh, Geospatial Consortium Services, web services, and we have our packages. I will go through this uh, very quickly. Next, please. So the portal is uh, basically when you can ask for a country uh, statistics. So you select, for example, a country, in this case, Mexico, and you can see how much, how many records do we have in this area, how, how is the distribu distribution of record um, among the taxes, and how is the distribution of the records in the time. So you can also have a red list, species list, or an invasive species list. And if you click in one of the uh, species, you can go to the species page that can provide you information about all the records of that species that contains in, in Orbis. Next, please. And if you are developing, for example, a website or an application, you can go, uh, you can ask, you can request all this using a um, uh, URL uh, uh, request. So if you know the format and you can ask for example, the abundance is in this case of the, um, the lionfish, and the system will provide you a map that you can insert into your application without going into the portal. And next, please. 
and we are very um, uh, working very hard to develop uh, uh, in developing our packages, uh, which uh, are intended uh, to use for uh, by the scientists. So you can extract information from the database, and data from the database, using only three commands: the checklist that provides the checklist of uh, SPSI geometry, the occurrence. Uh, if you provide the geometry, say for example the EEZ or a region or a polygon that you design, you can extract all the records that uh, that Orbit has in this uh, particular geometry. And a leaflet map, map is an application that draw, uh, that provides you an ma interactive map. So uh, once you ex once you can extract all the data from the database and, and import it into R. You can work it out with uh, geo analysis, and you do you can do whatever you want uh, in a very flexible way. Play, next, please. So uh, we are also working with the new uh, R package uh, tools uh, that provide pattern matching and, and all the quality checks uh, to to be done in, uh, offline. So if you have a problem, you can use these uh, tools to check the, the quality of your data and, and set the data ready to uh, upload into the uh, regional uh, Orbis node. Next, please. So now, uh, in Orbis, we are uh, uh, collaborating with uh, many international processes and regional alliances. And for example, we uh, have been doing a, a, a work with uh, CBD for a description of the EPSA, which are the ecological or biological significant areas in the ocean. Uh, we are providing data for the first minute indicators of the World Oceanic Assessment. Uh, we are working with fi FIO to the vulnerable, vulnerable marine ecosystem, also with the deep sea. And as Frank and Nick mentioned, we are working very close with the GeoBond community and the GUS uh, uh, Geo, uh, eco, Geo Eco uh, panel. Uh, in order to provide a platform to uh, allocate the EDDs and the EOVs uh, uh, to uh, through Orbis. Next, please. So uh, for that, uh, last year we signed an agreement between uh, GeoBond, uh, Mbond, Bio, Goose Bio Eco Panel, and Orbis uh, to build a uh, to build a, a, a coherent, coherent system and coordinate the sustainable global ocean observing system. So uh, we think about um, that we have in the in this world we have some kind of requirements from the society and requirements from the scientific world. And uh, Goose is providing us with uh, with a framework uh, of the uh, for the definition of these essential ocean variables. Uh, those essential ocean variables will <laughs> ask uh, for, for society society question the questions for the society, and uh, we uh, they establish the links with the observing system the system observing system. So Mbon is more uh, um, more related to the research and development development and also to uh, answer more scientific questions. Um, so they will assist to the establishing establishment of the regional or local uh, uh, monitoring network. And all of this uh, information go to Orbis that provide a platform for uh, data sharing, the quality control, and the data harmonization. Also with a set of tools for the exploration and visualization Inclusion and also with a very extensive training program we are doing with the Ocean Research Global Academy all around the world. So with this partnership, we can we think that in the very very near future, we will we will be able to provide to, to the society products, indicators, and assessments, for example, related to the sustainable development goals and to the AC targets of the conservation of the marine biosphere. So um, that's it. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Eduardo, and uh, thank you also to Nick and to Frank for uh, taking the time to speak to us. It's a very interesting set of presentations, uh, which shows all the different aspects of actually doing observations of uh, biology and ecosystems in the ocean. Um, so we had a question um, from Tim, uh, which Nick has started to answer. What is the difference between a goose essential ocean variable in the biodiversity and ecosystem space? And the GeoBon or MBon essential biodiversity variable, which is a marine biodiversity variable. Um, so Nick, I don't know if you want to uh, expand on your answer, but then I'll also ask Frank to answer the same question. OK, could you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. 
Um, so it, it's been it's quite a, been quite an issue for us because the last thing we want to do is to set up two or even more competing systems. So if a lot of the uh, partnership which um, which Eduardo just mentioned is how to actually work together and use each other's skills. So I think um, really what seems to be happening is that the essential ocean variable level where we've generated some pretty high level variables, things like plankton abundance and biomass or zooplankton or fish. And, and they're providing that kind of higher level indicator or perhaps what might be reported to various conventions. Um, however, then the question becomes, what aspects of fish, what aspects of phytoplankton are you going to measure? And I think that's where the EBVs come in and they're starting to look at which genetic components might be looked at, how might you measure density, how might you measure abundance. And, um, and so they, they match, they're actually matching pretty well, in fact, that um, I think I briefly said that the, the EOVs are, at the high level are showing us what we need to measure, and then the EBVs are, are kind of saying, and these are the aspects, which, uh, and this is how we'll measure these larger variables. I think while I have you, um, you talked about the importance of national and coastal waters for, for biology and ecosystem issues, related issues. Um, you also mentioned the challenge of scaling up these measurements, the need for capacity development, particularly in, in developing countries. The analysis of the, of the biology and ecosystems panel, which defined the essential ocean variables, um, focus particularly on global and regional conventions and indicators. Uh, do these all translate at the national level? Um, I think there'll be some additional things at the national level, but they do translate quite well because, of course, they are all global variables, but um, that the na in nations have to report on them, and like each individual in nation has to report on its SDGs or, or, or HE targets. So they do translate. Um, I think what's important is, especially in the area of capacity development and technology transfer, is that the EOVs or some form of global monitoring would allow countries, developing countries, to be part of a global network of, of scientists who are quite committed to generating and accessing this data globally. And so not only is the capacity built, but then these individual countries then become part of that global network and hopefully they'll be supported you know, for a long time so we actually get some more sustained capacity building. And what we are measuring you know, are fundamental aspects of, of the marine environment. Um, they won't be everything which needs to be measured, but they are some of the longer term variables which we need to measure to understand kind of ecosystem health. Thanks, Nick. Uh, maybe, Frank, do you want to respond to the question about uh, EOVs and EBVs? Yeah, I think that's a really critical question. And uh, these things develop sort of in parallel, and we're trying to bring them back together. So Nick is right. Uh, it, I, the way I see it, uh, anyway, is that EOVs are a superset of variables. It's very multidisciplinary. It includes the physics and the biogeochemistry. And it does have the, the biology variables that uh, are now being proposed as, as to merge into the infrastructure of goose. Now, the EOVs, uh, being a superset, do include biodiversity. And so to the extent that we can have the EBVs, or the uh, essential biodiversity variables, be part of the EOVs, I think we all benefit. It would be a, a shame if we go on and have, try to collect these things in a separate uh, without them being one part of the other. So I, I, we would lose out on the infrastructure and the uh, ability to integrate with uh, all this and existing programs. So I, I think that we need to see them that way. Uh, the intent is not only to support scientific research, but also operational activities. And so I think that uh, to that to that point of view, the, uh, the effort that Goose is going through in defining the requirements from uh, national uh, uh, programs and from international treaties is really valuable to the definition of the EBVs. So they, they are going through very systematically and going through all of the international treaties documenting what variables are required uh, to inform indicators for particular uh, targets of these treaties. And we can use that to define which biodiversity observations are required. So I think that that's, um, 
that's where the, the this all comes together. So Frank, my, my first question to you was about the data availability and you, and you identified um, uh, sharing data and protecting intellectual property as an important issue. What kind of things can you do to improve that data sharing? Well, I think that there has to be a realization that we will not, never be able to, uh, to monitor changes in life in the ocean uh, as a global community or even as a country if we don't understand what's happening in adjacent waters. And so that, that realization is very hard to come by, uh, especially biological data are very hard to, to obtain. Uh, they're, they're very hard measurements to make. And so traditionally, these data are, are hard to share. Now, no, that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen because all this proves that people do share these types of data and then you can look at trends over time. But there may be a, a, a need to understand the, uh, the the need for people to have, for example, object identifiers, the OIs for each data set, so it can be cited as a, a as a as intellectual property. There may be a period of embargo data, even though the data can be contributed to all this. There may be a way to uh, allow use by people that are doing assessments, but not by everybody, so they don't. Uh, lose the the right to publish, and so there may be several things that the, the community uh, can help improve the data delivery to to all this. One other thing that are, that is interesting is that there are new technologies that could be developed or are now being developed. Uh, it's still not feasible to deploy them everywhere, like with the uh, Goose infrastructure, for example, on Argo floats. But if you can have devices that can measure noise and record sound and identify species or take videos and classify uh, organisms uh, on the fly, then you can start populating these databases a lot more quickly. And so that's where we, we need to aim. There's, a, there's an important market there for technology development, and I think that we need it to, to inform these uh, treaties on a more real-time basis. Thanks, Frank. I think Eduardo wanted to answer a similar question about uh, about the, what you can do to promote the sharing of data. Eduardo? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, the problem with the, with the lag that we have in the, all this data is probably related to two questions. One, uh, actually the people want to keep the data by themselves. So uh, it's very, they are very, uh, you know, shy to, to, to share the data. Also, if, uh, if they think that it demands a lot of time and effort to convert the data into OBIS format. Uh, the second one is that the people really don't know what OBIS is. So there is a lot of uh, myth and, and misconception about what the OBIS is, uh, probably um, deriving from the old version of OBIS where we can only were able to accommodate occurrence data. Now we have this uh, environmental uh, schema that we can accommodate environmental variables along with the uh, biological records. So we can accommodate uh, uh, not only occurrence, but abundances and, and many other uh, variables that we can measure, traits, whatever we can measure on the biological records. And uh, so uh, what we need is to make the people understand that all this is a system that provides them an integration facility. So it's not very easy to find some place that you can, for example, com you can compare your data with many, many data sets all around the world, and all this can provide you with that. So for that, we are doing this kind of initiative, like this webinar, and we are also developing a very aggressive uh, training program. We are doing training uh, um, uh, seminars and workshops all around the world uh, to let know the people what all this is and what you can do with all this. And um, once the people start uploading data into OBIS and see and compare the, their own data with the database that data sets that are already in the system, you can see that OBIS is really a good system. OBIS is a really, is a really system that can provide you with uh, uh, powerful uh, data that you can analyze and produce indicators uh, for yourself. So yes, we need to fix some things like UIs, for example, and you need to, we need to fix the, the issue with uh, uh, with embargo of the data. But uh, we are working in a, in a new version of OBIS uh, that will uh, provide to the users this, those kinds of facilities. 
So I, I really recommend uh, the people to, to look into all this and to contact your regional centers and to contact the researchers that are already providing data to all this to understand what all this can do. Eduardo, you talked quite a bit about the quality control that goes into creating a global database like OBIS. Um, part of that quality control is linked to metadata about how an observation was taken and, and that links to observing standards. So can you say a little bit about how you do that now in terms of how, how, you, how you use metadata and what kind of metadata you have and how that could be facilitated by developing some standards in the future? Yeah, uh, actually there are two different things. The one is the meta metadata that uh, we care about the, the collection of the, the characteristics of the data set. And we also have this uh, event, event score, that you can describe uh, the method using a controlled vocabulary about how the sample was taken and how the sample was collected and analyzed and what kind of, of measurements you are taking along with the sample. So now with this uh, uh, occurrence, abundance, environment, and measurement or fact schema that we have, you can accommodate all those details into your into your data set. So it's now in the standard. We, we are using this uh, into our uh, harvesting project program. So you can put, for example, if you have a, a census uh, sample, you can describe your graph using using the uh, control vocabulary. You can uh, locate your 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 sample. You can accommodate your sam your sample in your sampling protocol. So for example, you have a cruise, you have a stations, you have several legs. And you can put all, all the things in, into Obis, which is right now we cannot serve, actually, that we cannot serve to the community this information because the system is, is being updated. But we are hoping that in the next month, by the end of the year, we, we will be ready to serve to the community all the details of the metadata and the events, uh, the description of the event that provides the biological, biological data. Maybe I ask Frank. Um, for the for what Eduardo is describing in terms of uh, describing how uh, data is taken, uh, do you see from the observing perspective? Do you see practitioners taking taking that up? Are they are they recording the right kind of uh, metadata and information about how they take samples? Well, I don't think that there's any standards yet. Uh, there there are, there are different groups that collect things in different ways and. What we're hoping there's conversations going on with Eduardo and Ward Apple Towns and uh, people like Sky Bristol and the, the Ovis group on how do you facilitate that? Uh, how do you make tools easier for people to record the right metadata to include into such a sustained observing system? And so I, I think that there that you just have to make it easier for people to record the right type of data. And then you have to work on how do you integrate different databases. For example, the LTER community has their own database, and you know you have Data One uh, that that has their own. And so these things are not quite linked yet. And so we need to work to extract the biological data from these and to and, and make them more interoperable. The other one that is not quite linked is uh, things like GenBank and the nucleotide databases. So how do you link things like uh, the OBIS data sets, which are more species, they're trying to entrain some of the environmental data to genetics data. And you know the genetics people are going to put their data into GenBank and the equivalent in, uh, in Europe and Japan. So we need to find ways to make cross links between these databases that people are used to and not necessarily reinvent the wheel. So it, it's, it really all is all about connectivity. Okay, thanks, Frank. Let me, let me ask a question posed by Dan Lear. Um, this discussion has been focused largely on academic data, that is data taken by people in the scientific community. Is there work being coordinated to gain access or release for uh, from industrial or commercial data, for example, from the oil and gas industry or the aggregates industry? And government data, governments do a lot of surveys. So I, I think that these are very important data sets to, to entrain to the, into this process. Um, much data collected by industry has an embargo, so it's hard to break, especially in the oil company data sets. Some are more open than others, but this is, this is going to take a long time. Uh, and I, I think that the more we are organized together as a community, not just the academic community, but working with governments, uh, the more this is likely to happen. 
there's plenty of space here for industry to play a big role, not only in sensor development, but in conducting the assessments. Uh, thanks, Frank. Um, I'm, I'm going to maybe answer, actually, the question that's posed by Mark Costello. Is Goose also a network like Ambon that it, it relies on both members and others to do the sampling, make the observations? Um, it is. I think that there's uh, the concept of readiness in the framework for ocean observing is a very important one. Uh, Goose observations are largely still done by an academic community. Uh, there are some operational um, observations. But there's a spectrum, really, of, of readiness for sustained observing. Goose will really try to focus on what's uh, the sustained observing that's necessary to answer the key scientific questions that get at key scientific uh, societal issues. So I think uh, the analogy is, is, is um, correct, that MBON is a little bit like Goose, uh, and that the diversity of measurements that are made in MBON will um, will probably lead to a smaller set of those being sustained in the future to answer some of the key questions about how biodiversity is changing. Yeah, I would like to clarify yeah. there. I, I think uh, MBON is, is really, we're trying to organize a community to to link in terms of sharing protocols, uh, ideas on how to measure things, trying to promote the sharing of data. But we would like to use existing infrastructure to the, to the extent possible. Uh, not only national infrastructure or uh, observing programs, but things that are international that are shared like the goose element and build biology into it because there are many observations being collected and what is missing effectively are the biological observations and we need to make those together and at the same time in the same places as the chemical and the biological measure, the physical measurements. Certainly a lot of uh, scope for integration in Goose. So we've run out of time. We did start a few minutes late, but we are ending a few minutes late now as well. So let me um, thank our speakers, uh, Nick, who had to take off, uh, Frank and Eduardo, for your time and your energy in presenting these different facets of uh, measuring uh, biological and ecosystems aspects of the ocean. And uh, thanks to the audience, which was quite a numerous audience, for joining us. and. Um, more Goose webinars are coming, and you can see you can find out about them on the Goose website or in your email. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Eduardo. Thanks, Eduardo. Well, thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. And take a look at the, all these uh, sites and uh, all these tools and all these uh, schema that we have uh, uh, already worked, pointed out some some things in the summit. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.